Hello, hello, and welcome to episode 57 of the Compassion and Cucumbers podcast. I'm Christine. And I'm Sam. And um, Sam's a little under the weather today, so yeah. So don't judge her if she seems a little down. Yeah, <laughs> I'm not at my best today, I have to admit. Yeah, I'm yeah. Sorry, sorry about that. But hey, I'm still here and I'm still talking. Hey, the show must go on. Indeed it must. <laughs> Happy fall, everyone. I hope you're enjoying your fall. Oh, it's um, so beautiful. It is. It is beautiful. I mean, it's raining right now, but it was beautiful today. It is cooler, and we finally kicked our heat on. We couldn't take it anymore. Only yesterday, though. Yeah. It's not on now. No, it's not running now. But we did for a little bit yesterday. Yeah, just that it was like 50-some degrees in the house, and it was just a little too cold. I liked it. <laughs> but, you know. Yeah, just to take the chill off of things. Well, the kitties appreciated it. Yeah. Yeah, our one cat, Sammy, he's a, he's a house panther. He is. And he's... Uh, About 22 pounds, yeah, solid black. Considerably large house panther. And he immediately um, posted up on, <laughs> on top of one of the heat registers. Yeah, he just... <laughs> and he covered the whole heat register. <laughs> like, dude, um, we're trying to heat the house That's here, not helpful. just your cat belly. Yes, but he's like, no, my belly is nice and warm. Yeah, <laughs> that was pretty funny. Um, and we were hoping to be able to talk to you about the uh, Fall Fest at the farm at Mockingbird Farms Animal Sanctuary. But Sam, unfortunately, had a work conflict and we were unable to go, which was heartbreaking. So sad. I yeah. mean, we've been meaning to get up to Mockingbird for so long. And I got my work schedule confused, and so we were unable to make it because yeah, I was in a rehearsal with about 25-odd middle schoolers, All right? <laughs> which was really fun, by yeah. the way. <laughs> yeah. It was a farm of its own kind. Oh, yes. Yes. <laughs> Completely different kind. But, yeah. So yeah. Uh, John and Janelle, we're, we're sorry we couldn't make it. I did see some pictures. It looked like it was a great success, so I'm happy to see that. Um, and I can't wait to hear more about how the day went. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So today, first off, I want to talk, we have a recipe. So I want to talk about, um, the recipe I made for this week. Mm -hmm. So here is this week's vegan recipe of the week. This week... I made a recipe out of the book Crazy Good Vegan by Lloyd Rose, who, if you're not familiar with Lloyd Rose, he is the founder of Plant Crazy, and that's crazy with two I's, not a Y. Um, <laughs> and I've been following him on Instagram for a long time, and he has some really great recipes, and this book is fantastic. Awesome. Um, so follow him on Instagram and get your hands on this book, Crazy Good Vegan, um, because there's a lot of fun recipes in here. He is definitely plant crazy. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, check out his Instagram. And so this week I made a recipe called crispy broccoli in peanut sauce. I'm sold. Yeah. And Just on the title. Yeah, that, that tells you all, all about it. Um, it is actually a battered and deep fried broccoli over jasmine rice. Mm -hmm. And you make this beautiful peanut sauce. Yes. And I am like Sam is a sucker for whatever she's a sucker for. I am a sucker for a good peanut sauce. Hey, I'm with you on the peanut sauce. Yeah. Completely. This and was delicious. Didn't we decide I'm a sucker for cucumbers? Oh, slaw. Slaw. Right. Slaw. A is, sucker for a good slaw. Yeah, sucker for a good slaw. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm a sucker for anything with a peanut sauce on it. it yes. And this was beautiful. Yeah. Sauce was great. It Pe really was. Peanuty and gingery and uh, warm and um, it was uh, really filling too. It was. Yeah. And I have to say, props to you. You cooked the broccoli to perfection. Why, thank you. It was absolutely beautiful. Thank you. The rice was fantastic and the peanut sauce was gorgeous. Yeah. And so it was a very satisfying, very, um, f very filling fall meal. Yeah. And it definitely kind of scratched that Chinese takeout itch. Yeah. It had uh, definitely the feel of a takeout kind of meal. Yeah. Which, it really did. Which is good. And I think that this meal would make an excellent base for tons of other iterations. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And the one thing that I would say about this recipe, the one way I think it could be improved, because like I said, the sauce was great, the rice was great, mm -hmm. the broccoli was great, mm -hmm. um, is to add more vegetables. Yeah. Like, I, mean, I just wanted more It veg. is just, the recipe is just the broccoli. Yeah. But yeah, you could totally add other vegetables some to it. Cauliflower or some zucchini oh, yeah. or, you know, and then put some raw veg on the top. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, like. Yeah, this is a good base recipe. It really is. You just need to amp up the veg a little bit. Yeah. 
But that's just because we're veg fiends. <laughs> A little bit, yeah. A little bit. So, yeah, definitely uh, check out Crazy Good Vegan by uh, Lloyd Rose. And definitely check out his Instagram. Uh, and he's at, at plant crazy. And that's crazy with two eyes. Indeed it is. <laughs> so what's next? Um, so we pl- are going to talk about some vegan myths. And we're going to do a little myth busting. I love myth busting. What do you, what do you think? You want to do a little vegan myth busting? Yeah, let's bust some myths. All right. Let's do it. Bust the myth. <laughs> I'm sorry, I couldn't help myself. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, I am pulling up my Mythbusters. Okay, so uh, any vegan will know that there are plenty of myths out there uh, surrounding veganism. Absolutely. And, um, and maybe some that you don't know about or haven't heard. Um, but we're going to try and bust up a few of them. Yeah, some of the ones that are really, really pervasive and just they need to go away. Right. Yes. Yes, I titled my document, uh, Vegan Myths That Need to Die. But the thing is, you know, death, not so much. I know. You know, it's really not in the... uh, I was just being dramatic. Per (laughs) per usual, but, you know, I think they just need to go away. Okay. So the first uh, myth that we would like to bust is uh, eating vegan is expensive. Right. Now, this is... Only a myth in that qualifying verb is. Mm -hmm. Okay. Eating vegan can be expensive. Right. If you are relying solely on processed products, Mm -hmm. if you are relying on meat replacers. Sure. If you are relying on things that are attempting to be exact copies right of and i think um things that are familiar i think eating any in any way can be can be expensive oh absolutely you can make it you can make Without any question. diet expensive if meat is not cheap right certainly not now it should be more yes absolutely but if you need to eat on a budget which many of us do yeah, it's very easy to do that and be vegan. Yeah. So a lot of the staples of veganism, beans, grains, mm-hmm. um, vegetables, especially root vegetables, can be purchased relatively cheaply and can be purchased in bulk. Yeah. And they keep for a long time. They do. Yeah. Keep them in an airtight container in a cool place and... And you're good to go. Yeah. Okay. Similarly, pastas can be very inexpensive. You Mm -hmm. don't need to buy the top of the line, fresh, gluten-free, like, you know, all of the fancy stuff. (laughs) Right. You can just get a very, very simple pasta, you Mm -hmm. know, box of pasta, 99 cents. You can get four meals out of that if it's two people, you know, that kind of a thing. And certain vegetables like celery, like carrots, like potatoes, onions, sweet potatoes, um, those kinds of things are also relatively inexpensive. Mm -hmm. And even more so if you're buying vegetables in season. Yeah, try and buy your vegetables in season. And if you have an Aldi's near you, try and buy your produce at Aldi's because it is much less expensive. Yes, we love Aldi for veg. Um, Not only do they often have uh, better looking produce Mm -hmm. than our local tops, but it's far less expensive. Um, And so they are definitely our best source for veg outside of our farm share. Yeah. And they have a lot of organic options too. One point that I did want to make though, that is that you're, when you're buying your food, you should consider it an investment in yourself. Oh, absolutely. You know, so if you want to buy a particular vegetable, but you think it's maybe a little too expensive, consider it an investment in your health. Yeah. Right. Right. Because it's easier to invest in your health than it is to invest in medical bills. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. The uh, ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure cliche is yeah. not entirely a cliche. Yeah. So think of it as investing in, in not only your health, but in your ethics. Make that investment. Yes, absolutely. Remembering, of course, to eat within your means. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, we definitely would not recommend uh, choosing a vegan path that uh, has an incredible amount of expense to it. Like, for example, life is just more expensive if you eat out frequently. That's for sure. Life is just more expensive if you buy a lot of processed products. It is immediately more expensive. Well, 
It could be in many ways, but if you keep things relatively simple and get creative with your use of beans and grains and basic vegetables and fruits, then there are just huge numbers of options out there for you at a relatively low price. Agreed. So would you say we busted this myth? I'd say so. Myth busted. Yes. So eating vegan can be expensive, but eating vegan does not have to be expensive. Okay. We busted that one. Yeah, we did. Uh, Myth number two that we're going to try and bust is you have to take a lot of supplements to be healthy when you're vegan. Yeah. This one's not true at all. No. um, A lot of people, a lot of non-vegans, and I see a lot of kind of trolly non-vegans, you know, I hate to use that word, but um, try to defend their diet by saying that if you're eating vegan, that you have to take a ton of vitamins to make up for the fact that you're not getting those vitamins by eating animal products. Yeah, and that's just very simply not true. No, it's and not. There are two things that you do want to watch out for specifically, and we've talked about these before. We have. The first is B12, mm-hmm. okay? And B12 uh, comes from bacteria that is um, often found in animal products, but that's because animals are given feed that is supplemented with B12, mm-hmm. okay? It's not that animals are a natural source of B12. In fact, right. they're not. No more than right. plants are. So they're really just kind of the middleman mm-hmm. um, in this and every other uh, possible context. Yeah. But um, so, yes, of course, you want to make sure that you are either consuming products that are fortified with B12. A lot of um, nut milks and nut-based yogurts are fortified with B12. So that is one option. Or you can supplement B12. Uh, Christine takes a sublingual B12, but she doesn't do it every day. Um, mainly just because I forget. <laughs> Maybe I need to be taking something for memory. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, we need to get you some ginkgo biloba or something like that. No. Yeah, okay. Um, and I do take a multivitamin uh-huh. um, every day, which contains B12. But this is really outside of D3, which is the sunshine vitamin, mm-hmm. and which is really a concern for just about anybody in the Northern Hemisphere, regardless mm-hmm. of diet. B12 is the only thing that is truly absent in a vegan diet and would need to be supplemented. Everything right. else you can get from plants, right. all of your protein, all of your fiber, all of your iron, all like everything that folks tend to get really concerned about, all of them are readily available and in many cases far more easily than with plant, I mean, sorry, with animal-based foods. Yeah. Yeah. And one thing I just wanted to add is that vitamin deficiencies are not related to a vegan diet and they are a personal health concern and people of varying diets have been found to have deficiencies due to people's individual absorption issues. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think we addressed this on a on a previous episode we as well, is that I did have a B12 deficiency at one point, but it was not while I was vegan. Mm-hmm. It was before we went vegan. That's correct. Um, and yes, it was chalked up to an absorption issue and I don't seem to be having that trouble anymore. Okay. So, so there you go. I think we busted that myth. Busted. Myth busted. <laughs> myth, <laughs> myth number three Vegans don't get enough protein, especially if you're trying to build muscle. That's just plain not true. (laughs) It's just plain not true. And where this really comes from is the fact that um, it's often stated that we as human beings need far more protein than we actually do. Um, The amount of protein that is suggested that we consume each day is actually quite a bit beyond what is actually needed. Um, for the human body to function properly. Right. So, um, you know, I know that once when I was, you know, kind of focused on uh, fitness and training and building muscle and that kind of a thing, it was the idea of, you know, a minimum of one gram of protein per pound of body weight per day. That's a lot of protein. That's a lot of protein, even for someone who's on the smaller side, which I really am not. I'm kind of tall and wide and you know, mm-hmm. so it, it, yeah, that's a lot of protein and it's it's just not necessary. I always had trouble getting that much protein, you know, when we're talking 150, 160 grams per day. Yeah. Like that's just unreasonable yeah, for and, most people. And it seems like a lot of people uh, when they're counting protein, if they are like trying to build muscle or something, 
are only counting animal protein. Right. Like they're not counting the protein that they're getting from beans and, and vegetables right. alone yes. have protein. Uh, grains have protein. Tofu yes. has protein. Yes. So a lot of times people are omnivores that are trying to build muscle like this mm-hmm. are like eating massive amounts of animal protein. Right. On top of vegetables, they're getting way more protein than they need. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yes, for sure. And, you know, of course, all of that animal protein is causing harm Mm -hmm. in other ways to the body, not just to the animals themselves, which is obvious, but um, there are, you know, serious cardiovascular effects. Um, Mm -hmm. There are serious effects when it comes to how both fat and sugar are absorbed in the bloodstream when it comes to the consumption of animal products. So these are definitely things to think about. And so it is absolutely possible for athletes of just about every stripe, um, no, not just about, of every stripe Mm -hmm. to get the protein that they need through a plant-based diet. Yeah, there are plenty of vegan professional athletes out there that are vegan, basketball players and weightlifters and runners and and tennis players, surfers and You pick the sport, you're going to find somebody who's a a vegan and is excelling in that sport. Absolutely. The only thing that you really have to be aware of is that... That when you're vegan, your foods aren't as calorie dense. Yes. So a lot of times new vegans don't eat enough. Right. And that can definitely be a problem. I know every now and again, particularly if I'm in a phase of intermittent fasting, which I do from time to time, um, that I will supplement my protein intake slash calorie intake with a vegan pro, uh, protein shake, yeah. like a, a pre-mixed protein shake. Yeah. I really like um, O-W-Y-N, which is only what you need. Theirs are wonderful. Um, and so every now and again, like that will be the way I break my fast because I don't want to eat a whole heck of a lot. Right. Because usually for me, fast breaking is not long before I have to teach and I don't like a full stomach Yeah, when I'm teaching. So, you know. So there are ways to supplement protein if you feel that you need to, um, but in terms of just getting the basic amount of protein that a human being needs to function, um, it's very, very easily done on a vegan diet. I agree. So I'm saying myth busted. Totally. All right. Next one up. Next myth. That all of us uh, vegans have heard from time to time is that eating vegan is boring. <laughs> well, I hope that the many episodes that we've had talking about food have just busted this already. I mean, I know we're not boring. No, we're not even remotely boring. <laughs> and the food that we eat is not even remotely boring. Um, I think we've said before that we've found that our outlook on food and our kind of our food horizons have expanded like crazy yeah. since we've gone vegan because when we were omnivores we got into a rut of we're going to make a an animal protein and a starch and a veg mm-hmm. and that's dinner pretty much every night of the week mm-hmm. and so not having that as a fallback has just made everything more interesting yeah, I definitely think it, it expands your food horizons. And I think almost all vegans find that their diet becomes more diverse after they go vegan. Oh, absolutely. They're trying new things. And uh, who's eating jackfruit? When, you name right. an omnivore that's eating jackfruit. Exactly. <laughs> you know? I mean, we eat all kinds of things that we never would have eaten when we were omnivores. Yes. Yes. And, you know, we've both become more fond of things that we didn't think we were fond of before. Mm -hmm. You know, I've gained a new appreciation for certain mushrooms, which I've never liked. Right. I've gained an appreciation for tofu, which I never really ate before uh, we went vegan, or at least not in any serious way. You know. Yeah, I was a big fan of tofu. Um, I guess it carry over from my vegetarian days. Yeah. But um, you never were like I used to make you tofu scrambles, but you never really liked them. No, very but much. now I'm all about a tofu yeah, you've scramble. Definitely grown to like them. I have. Yeah. Either I've gotten better at making tofu scrambles, or you. <laughs> well, it's probably a little bit of both, and yeah. you know, you're very kind. You leave out the black salt. Yeah. Which is my major objection. I can't stand the smell. <laughs> it's very sulfuric. It's very sulfuric. Yeah. And I just can't stand I, I just it. don't use it anymore. It's not necessary. Mm-mm. I mean, I like it. I like just at the end to sprinkle a little bit of that gives a kind of an eggy texture. Te- or I'm sorry, <laughs> not a texture, a taste. Yeah. And Sam just doesn't like it's it. Just so I just, I me. leave it out. Yeah. 
Yeah. So I think we have, uh, what do you think? Yeah, totally busted. busted. Like there's, I, I find that there's nothing boring about vegan food. I mean, Christine sometimes will laugh like as she's bringing dinner you know, into the room where we're eating and she's like, here we go, a big salad. Here's and your I'm big like, salad. <laughs> and I'm like, awesome. Yeah. So even though, yeah, we do have things that are on our heavy rotation, things that we eat frequently, yeah. like big salads mm-hmm. or, you know, maybe spaghetti or what else do we do quite often? Um, I don't know. Burritos. We, well, we only do, we, we do burritos. Burritos are a fridge clean out. They are. Like tonight we had burritos. Yeah. And that was leftover rice from last night Mm -hmm. and a leftover um, rice and veg that I had left over from a burrito bowl that we made a few days ago. The sweet potatoes. And the tofu, I reused the tofu. I actually mixed a little Frank's Red Hots into it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. To to give it a little extra spice and extra zing. And then I made a burrito out of all that stuff. I added a little avocado. So, yeah. Yeah. But we don't do burritos that often. Maybe maybe once a week or maybe. once every two weeks. We do bowls pretty frequently of yeah. some kind. Bowls. Yeah, lots of bowls. And but lots they're of salads. never the same. No, 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 no. Yeah. There's definitely infinite variations on the theme. Yeah, so we have definitely busted. We have busted the heck out of that myth. Yes. Busted. Busted. Myth number five. Animal deaths caused by harvesting vegetable crops make it not worth going vegan. I really hate this myth. Yeah. I really do. Admittedly, it is impossible not to cause animal deaths in the process of harvesting foods. We know that there is plenty of wildlife that likely live within our farmlands. Mm -hmm. And certainly if we're not talking mice, moles, rabbits chipmunks, squirrels, et cetera, et cetera, all of our small mammal friends, then certainly we're talking about insects without question. So it's impossible to cause that harm. But the thing is, the number of animals that are killed by deforestation to make room for crops to feed animals that are only being raised to be killed. Right. The difference between those two things, between the agriculture, the animal agriculture industry itself and just farming plant-based crops is there's no comparison between the two. Not even close. No. Yeah. No. It, um, the amount of animals that die in harvesting of vegetable crops pales in comparison. It really does. And again, we just have to go back to ethic. If the primary ethic is to do as little harm as possible, yeah, mm-hmm. we all acknowledge that we cause harm simply by existing. We can't not. Right. It's impossible to eradicate all of it. Um, but to do as little harm as possible, if that's what we start from, then the animal agriculture industry has got to go because it's causing harm not only to the animals that are being slaughtered directly, but to the environment, to the animals that are losing their habitat through Mm -hmm. deforestation, to the animals that are losing their lives through the process of farming in many different ways. Yeah. Yeah. So that myth? Not even even close. So I think that myth has been (laughs) appropriately busted busted myth number six i think we're up to vegans make foods that look like meats because they really just want to eat meat no (laughs) i how many times do you see online i know you don't because you don't do social media i don't but um a lot of uh vegan posters will get non-vegans that post um why do you always want to make your food look like meat like a veggie burger why Mm -hmm. do you want like why do you want impossible burger why do you Mm -hmm. want vegan chicken nuggets Mm -hmm. why not just eat the meat well apparently uh apparently (laughs) these posters are missing the point yeah that's exactly what i was gonna say yeah they're just missing the point being vegan doesn't mean you give up the taste right you stop enjoying the taste of your favorite foods or of foods that you used to eat in animal form. And if there's a version available, doesn't mean you're not going to eat it. But I have absolutely no desire whatsoever to consume meat or dairy or eggs or fish or honey. Right. Or any of that stuff. Right. Like none of it. 
I don't see finding an appropriate substitute as being contradictory in any way, shape, or form. No, not at all. Because most of us weren't haven't been vegan all of our lives. No. So we want those comfort foods and, and foods that kind of connect us to our families and our culture. Absolutely. You know? And to do it in a way that causes less harm yeah. is in support of the vegan ethic. It's not that we're trying to make our food into animal food. Right. No, you know. we want to eat the foods that right. enrich, enrich our lives without killing a bunch of animals in the process. Right. And for us in particular, like a lot of the things that you're talking about, you're talking about burgers, you're talking about sausages, you're talking about breakfast sandwiches, you're talking about, you know, all kinds of things that um, are usually not readily available in plant-based form, like at a fast food place or something like that, or at a diner or whatever. Um, those things are occasional indulgences they're not the right. basis of most vegan diets no and e but even if they were even, even if, if they you were 100 yes. percent junk food vegan you're still causing less harm in the process and you right. may be harming yourself because those foods are not not is they're uh, not the healthiest healthy choices. As, as they what are you healthier than their animal counterparts right. yes but but, you know, there's still saturated fats and stuff are. In, in those foods. Um, so you're not doing yourself any favors, but you are still uh, holding true to your, your ethics. If you are an ethical vegan, you can eat all the junk food you want yeah. and you're not you're harming anybody but yourself. Yeah. And I think this is just the big misperception that veganism is a diet. Right. And it's not. It involves dietary change. Right. You know, to be an ethical vegan requires that you make some dietary changes. But that's not really the heart of it. No, that's just a, kind of a side effect of it's it. It's a side effect. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Um, so would you say we busted that myth? Busted. We busted that myth. <laughs> um, myth number seven is uh, vegans think that they're superior to others. Well, I know I do. <laughs> <laughs> I know you do. No, I, I don't. She really doesn't. <laughs> I joke, but she really doesn't. No. Um, I think that this myth comes from non-vegans feeling defensive about their choice not to be vegan. Whenever you're involved in an argument that has seemingly two concrete sides and one side seems to be obviously more towards the common good mm -hmm. or towards a, a deeper morality or something like higher consciousness or something like that. Right. Those who do not adhere to that side of the argument will immediately feel defensive. It seems that way. And made to question why they do not adhere to the other side of the argument. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, I know there's a t-shirt out there somewhere that says, you know, don't ask me why I'm vegan. Ask yourself why you're not. Right. And I think people get really uncomfortable with that question. Yeah. They have to, you know, question themselves. Yeah. You know, they're question their own moralities and, and. Well, I mean, yes, their own moralities, their own ethics, their own choices. Of course they do. And I, I don't think a lot of people like doing that. And, no. you know, I think it's hard to admit when your actions don't agree with your ethics. Yeah. Um, and you feel like you have to justify that in some way, shape or form. Yeah. And the easiest way to come back at that is, oh, well, you know, vegans are arrogant jerks who think they're better than everybody right. else. Yep. Which, from my experience... In the last four years, as we've been meeting more and more and more vegans through VegFests, and I have to say, I am super excited for this um, advocacy conference this weekend. Yeah. Like, I cannot wait um, to just be in a space with so many um, like-minded folk. Like, I just can't wait. But the every vegan that I've met, as far as I've known them, have been just happy and pleasant and very kind and very accepting and very curious. And, you know, I have not seen that kind of vegan superiority complex in, in evidence. Yeah, no, I, I haven't either. And, and I just think that, 
uh, a lot of those reactions from people uh, that aren't vegan, it's because of the years of conditioning yeah. that we've been subjected to by advertisers and the animal farming industry. You immediately start to feel like guilt and defensiveness mm-hmm. and and it's conditioning. Yes. You know, and I know even when I was a vegetarian that people would kind of react that way about, mm-hmm. you know, why don't you eat meat? And and uh, they would get defensive just because of your food choices. And right. It's very odd. It's a very odd phenomenon. But I think the only explanation for it is that we've been conditioned. That's right. You know? That's right. I mean, food is history. Food is family. Food is tradition. Mm -hmm. Food is a lot of things. And in many cultures, those foods include meat. So moving away from that can feel like you're distancing yourself from your upbringing or from your family traditions, right. things like that. And that's not an easy thing to do. It's not. No, by any stretch of the imagination. No. So, um, but that, it, that definitely does not mean that those who have accomplished it, ourselves included, <laughs> feel like we're any better than anybody else. No. And no. We certainly understand that there's a process to this and we certainly understand that everyone comes to it or not in their own time. Yeah. I mean, I know the only thing that I often think of now that we've made that change and have been living that life for a good four years is, wow, I wish we'd done this sooner. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, yeah, I also kick myself. Why, why didn't, why we, didn't do we do this sooner? Yeah. You know, because I think once you make the change, it feels obvious. Yeah. In a lot of ways. Uh-huh. It's just like, of course. Yes. It does. It does kind of feel like, um, like a veil was lifted off of your yeah. eyes and you see, uh, things in the animal industry mm-hmm. for what they really are. And you just, it is hard to reconcile within yourself sure. why you didn't see that before you know but i know for me it's just like once we did go vegan it was like puzzle pieces fell into place yeah it's like oh my gosh yes absolutely this is the way we need to be living this is who we are yeah and uh while i'm sure there are some narcissistic vegans out there there's no more narcissistic vegans than there are in any other community of people so (laughs) you know you get a few in every community that's right you know you can't it's unavoidable yeah it is so would you say we uh took care of that myth or I sure hope so. Okay. Busted? Yeah. Busted. Okay. Myth number eight, which is kind of fun, is that people think that vegans are all hippies. I wish they were. <laughs> <laughs> I know the world could always use more hippies. The world can use more hippies. <laughs> it's so true. <laughs> yeah. No. Um, like when we go to veg fests or whatever, there's people from all, all walks of yeah. life. All walks of life. Yes. You know, sure. You can be like, we actually will occasionally refer to ourselves as hippie vegans. Like I've definitely referred to myself as a vegan hippie yoga freak. Right. Um, (laughs) And I have no problem with that title. Um, But at the same time, I work in academia, you know, so it's not that I'm completely outside of the establishment. Right. You know, I, I work in a public educational institutions. So Mm -hmm. there's certainly some bureaucracy going on there. You know, you have vegan doctors, you have vegan attorneys, you have vegan singers and artists and um, just everyone. There's there's vegans everywhere and in (laughs) every profession. There are. And no, they're not all hippies. They are not. Although if you Think of the definition of a hippie as being someone who, you know, thinks and acts in a way that is counter to the establishment. Yeah, I mean, yeah, the definition of hippie uh, is really anti-establishment and and all that jazz. So, so there is something to be said for that, you know, and that and that hippies are generally considered to be, you know, all peace and love and compassion right. types, which vegans tend to be. So yeah. it's, I I, we, I think that... We could be called worse. Oh, yeah. But it's definitely not all vegans are hippies. No, 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 not at all. They just tend to be very compassionate, kind people. Yeah. Yeah. So I think we busted that myth. I suppose so, although I don't really see a need to bust that one. 
I'm like, I'm okay with that one. <laughs> okay. Um, myth number nine. Vegans are all skinny and malnourished. Okay. If you could see the two of us sitting here. Neither talking- one of us are skinny. No. No. no I was far not- skinnier before I was vegan. <laughs> I mean, I didn't gain weight as a vegan. I gained weight as I got older. Right. But, you know. Yeah. For us, weight gain is more age related than diet related. Yeah. But, um, yeah. So we are definitely not uh, skinny or malnourished. And we know plenty of vegans who are not. That's right. Um, yes. Of course, it is possible to take things too far, but I don't consider that to be a vegan issue. I consider that to be a disordered eating issue. I think we've talked about how some people equate veganism with a restricted diet, right? And and that can trigger. But Sam was somebody that had a disordered eating, yes, in her past, and uh, going vegan definitely did not trigger any. No. Any disordered eating in your case? No. In fact, it did quite the opposite. I feel like going vegan has done a lot to repair my relationship with food instead of, you know, reverting back to uh, destructive patterns that I had in the past. So I do feel that any malnourishment that is coming from any diet, omnivore, vegan, keto, whatever you're doing... Um, has nothing to do with the actual diet that you are choosing. It has to do with disordered eating. Yeah, I agree with that. Regardless of of what the content of of your diet is. Yeah. Yeah. So I think we busted that myth. Well, yeah. Busted. And our last myth, because we're going to try and keep this episode a little bit short because, like I said, Sam's not feeling so good. Yeah. Our last myth, and it's kind of a controversial myth, is that soy and tofu are bad for you. Yeah, there is. A lot of people see that, say that. I see a a lot of people posting on uh, food posts Mm -hmm. where somebody posts something made out of tofu and someone else will post, you should not be eating tofu. Tofu is terrible for you. Tofu causes cancer. And um, the exact opposite is true. Yeah. Uh, the plant estrogens in soy products are actually cancer fighters. They are. Whereas the um, estrogens that are found in uh, animal products and particularly in dairy products are incredibly harmful and are carcinogens. They've mm-hmm. been proven to cause and um, exacerbate cancers. Yeah. So, yeah, they're not the same thing. And so, yeah, phytoestrogens that you get from soy um, actually have some cancer-fighting benefits, especially when you're talking about breast cancer and any other cancer that deals with the reproductive system. Mm -hmm. Um, So breast cancer, testicular cancer, ovarian cancer, all of those kinds of things, phytoestrogens can be um, beneficial in the fight against those cancers um, and can actually help to prevent them as well. Yeah. And so um, I know that soy has a bad rap at times um yeah uh, i think it's it, it is uh definitely i think bad information and misinformation probably started by the meat industry right and another thing to consider if folks out there are concerned about their intake of soy the animals that you're consuming are fed an incredible amount of soy yeah The vast majority of soybeans grown on the planet are grown to feed animals in the agricultural system. They are not grown to feed people. Yeah. And those are, those are latent with pesticides. Oh, yes. And GMO crops. So they are. It's not even good soy. No. And of course, we we would recommend that anyone who is consuming tofu on a regular basis uh, make sure that you're buying organic. Yeah. Make sure. that it is ethically sourced, you know, you want to make sure that you're not getting GMO soy. Almost all of the commercial tofu available now is organic. organic. Yeah. So uh, it's not something that you need to worry about. And cultures that consume a lot of soy products have historically lower rates of cancers. Lower rates of cancers and longer lifespans. Yep. 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 So we busted that myth. Absolutely. I mean, but, you know, we didn't bust it. There's tons and tons and tons of no. research out there no, the that facts, has busted it. The facts and science yeah, bust so that. So it really has nothing to do with us. 
No. We're just talking. <laughs> yeah, so that was our last um, myth that we wanted to bust. And there are a ton more that we can talk about. Maybe we'll do another Mythbuster uh, episode in the future. Works for me. Um, but we do want to k- kind of keep this a little bit short. So I am going to move on to housekeeping. Uh, do you want to read this week's uh, review, our Apple podcast review? Sure, I would love to. This review is titled Great Edition, and it's by Sled XL. Thank you, Sled XL, for the five stars. Christine in particular appreciates that. She's always looking I for love stars. Them. I love them. She loves them. Uh, short review, but a really lovely one. It says, fun and practical, lots to learn here. Really a great addition to the vegan space. Yeah. Hey, thank you, Sled XL. Thank you, Sled XL. Greatly appreciated. Thank you for your review and for your five stars. Yes. Special shout out for those five stars. <laughs> <laughs> We're still holding our Food Not Bombs fundraiser at our Buy Me a Coffee site. That's buymeacoffee.com backslash cucumbers. And you can give to Food Not Bombs who uh, create meals, uh, vegan meals for people in, in need in the Buffalo area. Yeah. What else? Join our Patreon. We always keep the link in the show notes. You can join, become a patron on our Patreon page. And there are three levels of sponsorship that you can join up and all of them have their own little benefits and you can get some cool merch. So so check out our Patreon page. Well, of course, you uh, want to point everyone towards this week's cookbook. Oh, and yeah. the link to that is in the show notes. Yep. And this week's cookbook, uh, once again, was Crazy Good Vegan by Lloyd Rose, who is the founder of Plant Crazy. Yes. And finally, a couple of events coming up for us this weekend. As you know, we will be at the Animal and Vegan Advocacy Summit in Washington, D.C. We leave Thursday morning. We are super psyched Mm -hmm. um, to go and just, oh my gosh, soak up. Yeah, it's going to be um, so much. It's going to be a lot of fun, and and there's going to be a lot of information. So yes. we're going to have to take a lot of notes. Yes, I'm super excited to just be in sponge mode, <laughs> you know, because yeah. so many of the people who are there are, you know, long-term vegan advocates yeah. and people that we can learn just so much from. So I'm really excited about that. Me too. Um, and then the following weekend, we have the Halloween and anniversary celebration pop-up market at the Vegan Center. That's in Tonawanda on October 29th uh, from 11 to 3. So if you're in the Buffalo area and you want to say hi and, you know, perhaps purchase some early holiday gifts, uh, we will be there. Yeah, we'll be there um, vending some uh, some of our merch. Um, Sam will have some hand-knitted items yep. available. Uh, so that should be a good time. Next week, um, I think we're going to do a Halloween episode. I know we're going to I know we're going to be chock filled with all that information from the Animal Advocacy Summit, but I think I want to hang on to that and do a Halloween episode next week. Well, I completely agree because, you know, we're getting back from the summit on Monday, yeah. which is our recording day. Mm-hmm. And I have a feeling we're going to need a little more time to digest. Yeah, we're going to need to everything that we've taken disseminate in all over that the infor- weekend. Exactly. Yeah. So I don't want to dive right into that as no. exciting as it is. Plus, you know, vegan Halloween, that's fun stuff. Yeah, we're going to, you know, let you know what candies you can buy, uh, maybe some costume ideas. <laughs> it, it should be it should be a rock, rocking good time, I think. Yep, I like it. Yeah. All right. Well, we we wrapped up another episode, episode 57 of the Compassion and Cucumbers podcast. Thank you so much for listening, everybody. And I hope you have a fantastic week. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Do you want to support the Compassion and Cucumbers podcast? Well, you can do that by joining our Patreon page. We have three different levels of support, and all three come with their own special bonuses. Hey, you can support the podcast and get yourself some really cool merch. All the links and deets are in the show notes. We'll catch you next week on the next episode of Compassion and Cucumbers.